नमस्कार एवरीबॉडी ओम मिस्टर विजय क्रांति जी की गेशला नमस्कार नमस्कार जी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर ऑन द फॉर द टेकिंग पार्ट इन दिस एंड आई एम आल्सो थैंक्स या सो नाइस टू सी यू अगेन एंड आई हैव बीन ऑन बीइंग अवेयर ऑफ यू बीइंग वेरी एक्टिव ऑनलाइन <laughs> yeah whatever i can do within limitations and today it's a great day listening to nirupam ji oh, thank you very much thank you indeed 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 it chant chant uh just lay everyone and before we we start our program i would like to request everyone to kindly keep your videos on and put your microphone on mute so that it would uh, avoid any interruptions that's not Tashle, uh, good evening again. Good morning, good afternoon to all the participants present in this webinar, and who are joining us from YouTube and Facebook Live from the different parts of the world in different time zone. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Tenzin Doma, Program Coordinator of Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Fourteenth Dalai Lama. I, on behalf of Tibet House, would like to welcome you all to the special lecture on the book, The Frack. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, the book, The Fractured Himalaya, India, Tibet, China, 1942 to 1962. The special lecture series are delivered by the leading scholars and academians and are open to the public and it aims to educate the general public in to uh, enrich the academic knowledge besides the culture and religious events. This time we have our speaker, Dr. Shirumati, Dr. Nirupama Raoji, former Foreign Secretary, Government of India, as a speaker and our chairperson, Professor Minakshi Thapanji, Director of Rishi Valley Education Center at Rishi Valley, Andhra Pradesh. Before we proceed, I would like to make a few announcements. Firstly, Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. We are delighted to announce the launch of first batch of new two months uh, duration Nalanda certificate course. It is a short duration, which is very systematic and comprehensive courses in Buddhist philosophy and psychology in English language, as studied and practiced in the tradition of Nalanda and Tibetan monastic universities. With the blessings of His Holiness the 14 Dalai Lama, Tibet House has been running successfully the first batch of five years Nalanda Master's course since 2017, which is on the verge of its completion in 2022. In the last few years, two batches of Nalanda Diploma course, one to one, uh, one, to one and a half year uh, duration, have been completed successfully, while the third batch will also complete it by this uh, this uh, this 2022. Close to 2,000 students from 44 different countries across the globe have been benefited from these various Nalanda courses within the last few years. Therefore, for this Nalanda certificate course to register, it will open on 1st May and will remain open until 3rd June. The teaching will take place from 5th June to 7, till 7 August. And for the monastics and students can avail of a 75% scholarship on the course fee, while participants from Nalanda Diploma Course 1, Nalanda Diploma Course Batch 2, Batch 3, and Nalanda Master's Course Batch 1 can avail 50% scholarship from the course fee. Secondly, uh, 23rd Batch of Tibetan Language Course is also offered by Tibet House New Delhi. We have, the, uh, we have four levels of learning, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and proficiency. The registration will open will open from 15 April till uh, 17 May. 
and it was launched formally on September 23rd, 2011. For this course fees, we have provided 50% scholarship for monastics and students from different uh, different institution, standard universities, and also on, uh, also to the uh, and Nalida batch one, batch two, batch three, and and Nalida master's course. So for further information, if you would like to know more about Tibet House programs and Tibet House uh, certificate courses, please visit our Tibet House website www.tibethouse.in, and also you can uh, mail us at office at tibethouse.in. For the programs, please mail us at pc at tibethouse.in. Thank you. And now I would like to request Venerable Geshe Dojo Damdila, Director of Tibet House, New Delhi, to kindly address the gathering. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. All the participants, um, respected uh, Tibet House Vice, Vice Chairperson, Shirimadi Dr. Nirupama Raoji, Respected Professor Menakshi Thabanji and our very dear friend Vijay Grandiji and uh, Dr. Fritz and all our dear friends who are here today with us. Um, indeed, this is um, a special lecture but that is a great honor for Tibet House that we have Dr. Nirubamaji. And for your information, uh, Tibet House, we were looking for the vice chairperson after our last vice chair, the, the first vice chairperson who uh, drew my tenure. The first one, Mr. D. Raskodraji. Uh, who was also the former the foreign secretary of Indi the India. Um, he resigned due to his age, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama appointed a late Srimadhi Dr. Kabila Vasanji, and uh, she passed away. And then uh, we were looking for a vice chairperson because this is a very important uh, the uh, position for Tibet House. Given that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the chairperson and a vice chairperson, and this is a great, greatly honored position and uh, somebody to direct Tibet House in the course of our various programs. And um, it is uh, Mr. Temba Sering, the former representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama here in Delhi, as well as the former uh, the minister in this the Central Tibetan Administration, and um, he very kindly suggested uh, the suggested and recommended the name Shirmadi Dr. Nirupamaji. And uh, then the I asked if the somehow we can bring it to the attention of his holiness, and his holiness so kindly the uh, not only approved so kindly the advise us that uh, Shirimati Dr. Nirubamaji is the right person for this post. And so today in public, of course, we already made it public since last time, but again, this is to bring to the attention of all the participants here that Dr. Nirubamaji, not only of the one of the foreign secretaries of Indian government and also uh, the ambassador to various places in the world, um, and she is uh, the our vice chairperson, the government body, Tibet House. Uh, so, Dr. Nirubamaji, thank you so much for accepting to uh, make your presentation on your book, on your book which was launched last year, and that we have um, the Professor Minakshi Tabanji and all the participants here must know Professor Minakshi Ji. Uh, that the His Holiness the Dalai Lama, since many years, uh, was being invited to Delhi University uh, to give public addresses, directions, advice, and so forth. 
and which were mainly done through the uh, the through the involvement of Professor Manakshi Thapanji as there as the uh, the the one to to lead the all these invitations to want to extend this institution on behalf of the university. So this is how uh, Professor Manakshi also has been extremely close to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for all these many years. <clears throat> And I also had the honor of working very closely with Professor Manakshi and she uh, pertaining to organizing joint programs between Tibet House and Delhi University under the Kothari Center, which Professor Manakshi G was once the, the director of. And today we have Professor, Professor Manakshi G um, the, as the, um, uh, the director of Rishi Valley School and that we are honored to have Professor Manakshi as our chairperson for today's talk. So Professor Manakshi Ji, welcome you to this um, the, the, to this evening uh, talk. And um, so this book is extremely uh, significant and we already earlier, we had a glimpse of this, the, the book through the um, a brief talk by Prof. Uh, Dr. Nirubhamaji already earlier. So today is going to be a full lecture on this. So it is a great honor for all of us that today the author of the book herself is making the presentation to give us the synopsis of what this book is all about and um, interacting with Dr. Shirmati, Dr. Nirubhamaji itself gives you a very rich a reflection on the the relationship between these three, uh, say the, the the ones, the three nations, and um, China, India, and in between, Tibet as a buffer state, and uh, this is going to be a very significant day for all of us. So, with this in mind, uh, all the participants, let us now request Professor Manakshi to to chair this session and Dr. Shirmati Nirubamaji to present her talk on her own book. Thank you so much. Welcome, the one and all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Geshila, for such a warm introduction and warm welcome to both uh, Dr. Nirupama Raoji and myself. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today. I've known Geshila not only as a collaborator in these programs that he mentioned, but also as a teacher in Tibet House, where I used to come and attend his classes. And I hope that I have a little bit, I took away a little bit at least from you in all those years that I was coming there with my husband. So uh, today it's a great honor to be here because especially I'm a great admirer of uh, Dr. Nirupama Rao uh, as a woman because I felt she is able to combine different aspects of her personality as a diplomat and also as an intellectual. So I would like to just, I know we all know who she is, but I would like to briefly just tell you that uh, she not only joined the Foreign Service in India in 1973, but she held many important assignments. And as Geshila mentioned, she was the, um, the Foreign Secretary from 2009 to 2011. She was also the first woman spokesperson in the Ministry of External Affairs and the first woman High Commissioner to Sri Lanka and the first Indian woman ambassador to the country, to People's Republic of China. I think these are really great accomplishments. So congratulations, even though they come so late in from me. Uh, but I have always read about you. You're also the author of the book on India's China relationship, telling it on the mountain, India, Tibet and China, 1949 to 1962, published by Penguin. Uh, Dr. Rao has also received many awards, uh, including from the government of Kerala, and from the Rotary International Bangalore and from the Kalinga Literary Festival in Odisha. And she is also incidentally uh, was named to the global list of the 100 most influential women on Twitter by foreignpolicy.com. Now, uh, uh, 
Ambassador Rao and her husband are, have set up a Bangalore-based trust called the South Asian Symphony Foundation, uh, which is really interesting because it's about uh, furthering the cause of music and uh, you know peace, mutual understanding in South Asia through music. So I think these are all very uh, you know sort of uh, endearing qualities that I admire in her. And in November 2018, she received the Fellowship of Peace Award, which was conferred by the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Center at Washington, D.C. I now request uh, Dr. Rao to please give us her lecture for which we are all waiting in anticipation and with pleasure. And uh, I request you to keep a little time for us at the end for questions. I'm sure the audience will want to interact with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meenakshi Papan, for your warm words and references to me. Uh, I feel privileged to be a part of this discussion today. Uh, Geshela, Venerable Geshela, and all the members of Tibet House and the audience <coughs> gathered from not only in, from India, but from all around the world. Uh, Tashi Devek, Namaskar, uh, good, e good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. I'm going to, um, it is indeed a privilege, uh, Geshela referred to Tibet House and my being appointed the vice chairperson of Tibet House. I consider it a true honor and a great privilege to have been uh, nominated to this position with the blessings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, I look forward to working with all of you. As I said, it is a great privilege for me uh, to be here among you all, and I've always admired the work of Tibet House and all the uh, all the achievements uh, to keep alive, to promote Tibetan culture, not only in India, but in the world. So I look forward to working with you. I'm going to talk about my book, The Fractured Himalaya, uh, India, Tibet, China, 1949 to 1962. This is the book. And it was published by Penguin uh, in October last year. Uh, it was the culmination of uh, some I would say seven years of research and four years of writing. Uh, so it, it's a big book. Uh, it, uh, it, together with the academic references, it runs into uh, almost 600 pages. Uh, so it's a heavy, heavy book, but it's also available electronically on Kindle. And I also did an audio version of the book. So those of you who have access to audible.com uh, you can listen uh, to That's me reading in my own voice. Uh, it was quite a, a quite a uh, you know marathon uh, feat because I think it took me 17 days to read the book, and the total recording runs into over 13 hours uh, of actual audio uh, file. So do take a look or do take a listen, as they say. Okay. Now uh, the question that I'm asked very often is why such a book was necessary? Why did I write the fractured Himalaya? Why do I call it the fractured Himalaya? i would come to that. I felt that as a diplomat practitioner, somebody who had served the nation in the foreign service, uh, as a civil servant, as a diplomat, as an ambassador of our great country, uh, I, had, uh, I had been privileged to acquire some unique perspectives about the relationship between uh, the two largest nations in the world in terms of our populations, India and China. We are next door neighbors. We share a long boundary of over almost 3,500 kilometers. And uh, the, the whole issue of Tibet is very much an intrinsic part of this relationship because the Tibet autonomous region of China today borders India all along the length of this mountainous border, the Himalayan border, except for a small stretch that is the border of uh, Ladakh and Xinjiang, uh, autonomous region of China. So I had studied the subject at close proximity, and my attempt is, uh, has been to present uh, an understanding of both the human factors and the policy factors involved in the unfolding of this narrative. So 
I think my book is an assessment of policies, of personalities. It's an account, my personal account of border crossings, you can call it, between a practitioner's world and the world of a historian. Of course, I'm not a trained historian. I'm not an academician by, by profession. So when you read the book, you will understand that it is a practitioner's viewpoint. I come to it from the perspective of somebody who has served in the government and who has been in the thick of negotiations, who has literally worked in the trenches. But my aim has been to provide a rational understanding of the subject, a kind of a wide angled perspective of the early history of the relationship between India and China, the early modern history, I mean, of the relationship between India and China. And why have I done so? I have done so because what happened in those fateful years between 1949 and 1962 continues to influence India's thinking and also China's thinking on the disputes that exist between the two of us till this day. So um, that was the purpose of writing this history. It's a history, I call it with human, human characteristics. It's a kind of moving picture of that time. And my hope were, is, was and is that a young demographic, we have many young uh, Tibetans in the audience today, many young Indians. I hope that a young demographic will base their understanding of this very complex subject uh, with an approach that is defined by reason and also by imagination so that they are able to recreate the events I write about, which marked a very formative period in the history of our two nations. Now, uh, there is a lot in this book about Tibet. And there is a lot in this book about Jawaharlal Nehru. And I'd like to talk first about the role of our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. My own personal opinion is that we cannot make simplistic deductions about blaming Mr. Nehru uh, for all that went, did not go completely right in that period between 1949 and 1962. Because my view is that history is very complex. There is a warp and a weft to its fabric, and you must understand how it has all been woven together. And uh, so that history becomes a source of value uh, to understanding the present. And Mr. Nehru wanted India and China to be together and as an independent force in world politics. It was a lofty aspiration, and I don't believe it was adequately reciprocated by the Chinese. Yes, it's true that there were weaknesses, there were oversights in Indian policy towards China during this period. Uh, you, can, you can say some of the policy making was haphazard, some of it was ad hoc, some was, some was even careless. But my intention is not to apportion blame because it's always very convenient with the benefit of hindsight to draw conclusions and to make judgment. But hindsight can never be 20 by 20. We must re realize that. And most importantly, we must understand the circumstances in which these decisions were made by India, by China. They were decisions made in real time. And we cannot use the luxury of simplified hindsight to understand the subject. And as the saying goes, stories cut across maps and my story cuts across maps of both countries. And map lines are very complex and convoluted and they uh, seem to ignore and overlook the fact that this entire frontier zone between India and China has included Tibet, has included the Himalayan peoples, has included a complex ethnog ethnography complex cultural, linguistic, religious, and spiritual give and take. And today, we tend to forget all of that when you look at the border disputes between India and China, you look at the tensions along the line of actual control. We, we do not understand what the meaning of frontiers is, what the meaning of contact zones, which involve the people in between, as I call it, whether it's the Tibetans or whether it's our, uh, the people of India's Himalayan fringe stretching from Ladakh to Arunachal Pradesh. 
Now, Nehru, I felt, I, as I was able to glean from my study and my research, knew many things, but he was not exactly an expert on China. Uh, there was a kind of an inspirational uh, perspective that he adopted when he looked at relations with China. And uh, the people around him, the policymakers, the bureaucrats, did not really seek to influence his thinking. I, I, he, he perhaps did not take the advice of those who felt you should be more realistic about China. Uh, he tended to take the advice of those who fitted into his own view, his own inspirational view about China. But that is, we are all human, I suppose, and uh, you know, to err is human, let us say. I'm not saying, uh, you know, we are here to forgive anybody, but to err is human. And uh, he also, I think, understood, and we must give him credit for this, that very subconsciously he understood that ultimately there would be rivalry and competition between India and China. That uh, the basic challenge in Asia, as he called it, running across the spine of Asia, the backbone of Asia, was the challenge between India and China. Uh, I think where he perhaps uh, did fell short of history's expectations, I would put it that way, uh, was uh, not to understand the question of the deep linkage of the Tibet issue to the question of India's northern boundaries. Because if you look at the Simla Agreement of 1914 and the whole question of the rights and privileges that the British Raj enjoyed in Tibet, the question of India's boundaries with Tibet in the Assam Himalaya, what is today Arunachal Pradesh, what was referred to in that agreement as the McMahon Line, was very much an intrinsic part of this whole question of the rights and privileges that India had enjoyed in Tibet and the delineation of a frontier that would separate in the tribal regions of Assam from uh, the, the region of Tibet. And uh, so in 1954, where India negotiated an agreement with the Chinese on the question of Tibet, and it, it, they called it the Panchil Agreement, it was a question of trade between India and the Tibet region of, of Tibet, we did not discuss the question of the border. We decided to leave it aside, thinking that the Chinese had not raised it. And uh, since they had not raised it, there was very un it was very unlikely that any problems would arise. And that, I think, was a grave strategic error, uh, lack of foresight, because a few years later, it was very clear that this border was not settled between the two countries, that there were disputes that they needed to be resolved. But by then it became too late. And Nehru took the decision, a very fateful decision, after the Tibet agreement was signed with China in 1954, to show our boundaries with China as fixed and determined and not open to negotiation thereby, which I think also tied India's hands considerably. Because ultimately international boundaries have to be discussed, negotiated, mutually agreed upon, between sovereign nations and in international politics today, there appears to be no other way, unless, of course, you use the might of military power uh, to enforce your claims, which is not the way a rule-based international order uh, should, uh, should operate. So uh, that, that was one, one uh, point I wanted to make. India's ties with Tibet are very complex. They're dictated, as I said earlier, by geography, but by also by religion, by pilgrimage, by trade, by cultural osmosis. And therefore, the India-China relationship, I always say, is a three-body problem because there is the question of Tibet embedded in the core of this relationship. And uh, therefore, as I said again, the deliberate dissociation of Tibet and her status from the issue of India's frontiers with Xinjiang and Tibet by the policymakers in Delhi at that time, once China had entered Tibet, uh, was a move that did not yield benefit uh, for India. Of course, the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in India uh, gives the Tibet factor a continued saliency, a very important uh, position in the entire India-China 
relationship. Today, uh, now, uh, Geshe-la mentioned that, you know, he would like a synopsis of the book to be given to the audience. Now, this book begins with, uh, uh, with 1949, as is mentioned in the title, which, is, which was the year of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. But even before that, I have covered uh, some part of developments in the early 1940s. In fact, I go back even to 1924 to Rabindranath Tagore's visit to China, a very historic visit. We are approaching a centenary of that, of that visit. So I, try, I, have try, I tried to trace, I tried to trace in this book the whole germination of diplomatic ties between India and China uh, from 1949 onwards, between the Communist People's Republic and our Republic of India, under the patronage of the Jawaharlal Nehru and the Chinese Premier Chou Enlai at that time. Both these leaders interacted a great deal with each other, but they were very different from each other. Uh, as you well know, very, very different leaders. And I have talked about this also uh, in, in my book, which I invite you all to read. So I start with the establishment, I mean, the, the concrete uh, part of the chapters begin with the establishment of diplomatic relations, uh, the, uh, the personality of our first uh, ambassador to the People's Republic, the historian Sardar K. M. Panika, who, who emerges as quite a colorful character, as you will see in the book, and also as somebody uh, who's advised to Nehru in many ways influenced our first prime minister in his approach to China, and that advice was not always the best advice. But I also talk of personalities like Sir Girija Shankar Bajpai, who was the Secretary General of the NEA, and uh, Mr. KPS Menon Sr., who was the Foreign Secretary, and who had had a wide experience in China before that as the Agent General of India in Chongqing, and also as Ambassador in Nanjing. Uh, so uh, during the time of the of the Uh so I talk about them and their you know their reservations about how Tibet policy was being uh, being conducted. But I also want to underline, although these um, gentlemen, these experienced bureaucrats, had a lot of empathy for the question of Tibet, they also understood that realistically there was very little. The, uh, the uh, new Republic of India, which was still, you know, we were still working to consolidate our nationhood. And there were a number of challenges that we faced at that time. It would have been very difficult for us to take up arms against China to prevent China's ingress into Tibet. So those difficulties are also outlined in my book. I've tried to be as fair as possible, as objective as possible. And I've also brought out the pain and the suffering of the Tibetans who were literally caught in between in this relationship between uh, two, two giants. And uh, like somebody put, uh, put it, uh, I think one of our other Himalayan neighbors talks about being a yam between two rocks, literally huge rocks. And they were, the, uh, you know, Tibet in many ways was squeezed between these two countries. And then I, uh, I write about the negotiations of the 1954 agreement. I then speak about the decision to show the boundaries on our maps as fixed and determined. Then the discovery of the Aksai Chin Road that the Chinese built in Ladakh and the kind of effect of that, the shock waves emanating from that, uh, that discovery and how that became uh, you know, the event that exposed the wide chasm between India and China, uh, despite all that talk of Hindi, Chini, and Haidai, and uh, friendship uh, of, uh, of uh, one billion, as it was called at that time. But it is also quite interesting to see how in the 1950s, there, were, there was extensive interaction between the people's level between India and China, cultural delegations, exchange of academicians, historians, uh, uh, scientists, scientific, uh, you know, exchanges uh, and, uh, you know, study of trends in each country. So there's a lot of uh, scholarship still waiting to be unearthed and written about, about the interactions between India and China. Okay. I write about Jawaharlal Nehru's visit to Bhutan, uh, trekking through the Chumbi Valley in Tibet, which is, again, it's a very interesting part of what happened 
in uh, the 1950s between India and China and the kind of reception, the, the love and the honor that with which uh, the Tibetan people greeted uh, Prime Minister Nehru on that visit and how suspicious and uncomfortable the Chinese were about this. I speak about His Holiness and the Panchen Lama's visit to India in 1956 for the 2500th anniversary of the Buddha. Again, a very, very important uh, development, an important juncture in the India-China relationship of that time and the discussions between Prime Minister Nehru and Cho Enlai, which also refers you know, to the border. At that stage, the Chinese seemed inclined uh, to look at realities that had consolidated themselves along the, two, uh, the border between the two countries and work out an agreement that could take into account these realities. But Indian public opinion, once the Aksaichin Road was, was discovered, had hardened considerably and the mood in parliament, the mood in the public was extremely antagonistic towards China and Prime Minister Nehru's hands, I think, were, were pretty tied. Even I, although I believe deep down that he understood the need for a negotiated settlement, he understood that this might involve give and take. So then I speak about the, the again, another historic visit by Premier Chu and Lai to India in April 1960, a very abortive visit. Um, nothing came out of it. The officials of the two sides met. They were pretty infructuous talks. And then the descent into conflict. And I speak a little about the conflict and about uh, happened kind of humiliation that uh, many in India felt they had suffered as a result of Chinese military action. Uh, incidentally, this year is the 60th year of the conflict between India and China, so it's quite a watershed. And in that sense also, I hope my book will be read from that angle. I think mine is the first book to bring together these various skeins, as it were, these various threads in the fabric uh, to weave a narrative that not only includes references to the border and the differences between India and China on that, but I speak extensively of the diplomatic negotiations. I speak about the question of Tibet. I've tried to bring it all together. I've tried to create a coalescence of all these facets and these aspects. And I think this is important to understand. Uh, you know, when I speak about the, um, the entry of His Holiness into India in March 1959 uh, and his uh, flight out of Lhasa. Uh, I, I want young people in this country to understand you know, this history, this very, very vivid history of the India-China relationship, which is much more, much more than what you are seeing in terms of tension across the land. Actually, the truth. Everything should be put in perspective and ultimately we should understand that peace is what we all seek because without that there cannot be development, there cannot be prosperity. Our potential uh, as uh, as a country will not. Uh, it'll be. It'll take longer to realize if we don't have conditions of peace. And India's attitude to the Tibetan people, to the presence of His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama, who is deeply honored by the Indian people as a religious and spiritual leader, uh, you know, that is unshaken and that is very deep and uh, indisputable. I'd like to stop here because I know we should leave some time for questions. Thank you. Are we muted? Am I? Is it okay? Okay, yeah. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Rao, uh, for what I thought is such a compassionate rendering of this very fraught uh, history between the two nations. I really, as you were speaking, I, I felt that uh, compassion for both sides, for the uh, complex uh, situation in which the Tibetan people are trapped, as you said, squeezed between the two countries. I thought that uh, you brought that out so well. And uh, the other aspect of your talk that uh, really interested me is your focus on history with human characteristics. 
because I think it's that's what makes it such a compassionate rendering. Because I don't think it's often that we actually uh, look at history in this manner. Uh, we tend to uh, history has always been seen in terms of facts and figures, or the whole subaltern studies collective, which then tried to look at it from the people's point of view. But what you've done is, to my mind at least, gone beyond that because you are not taking an ideological position. You're actually trying to, as you said, uh, to use to ask your audience to use reason and imagination. But that's also what you are doing that you're not just bringing it uh, from what is recorded, but also in terms of uh, and without an ideological position, which is, I think, uh, very important in uh, in the making of history or the writing of history. Um, the other thing that I think we need to focus on and highlight from your talk is your emphasis on border crossings. Uh, that's again something that resonated uh, with me because I feel it's a border crossings that uh, you talk about are not just of physical boundaries, but also in the nature of human roles, the kind of decisions that were taken, the complexities with which Nehru had to deal uh, with the situation. Uh, you know, you pointed both his weakness and both his, uh, his strengths as well. And uh, a lot of this uh, comes, this also is a kind of crossing of borders. And finally, you spoke about His Holiness's crossing of the border and what that means uh, to a country like ours and to China. And what is the what are the implications of that? So, and your conclusion with uh, your emphasis on peace, the fact that we somehow have to work for that, we have to uh, keep that in sight and not be trapped in the kind of, uh, you know, sort of focus on, I know territorial boundaries are important and significant, but uh, in the context of what's happening in Europe today, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, to me, it seems the loss of the immense loss of human life. What has it been? What is it worth? You know, when His Holiness talks about we are one and in the end, it's whether it's the just recently, there's a conference on climate change where he spoke uh, yesterday, I think, where he talks about how even the butterfly, the, the bee, the bird, all of us, not just humans, but with nature, we are so close. And then for territory, we are ready to massacre each other. And as this is 2022, the World War II was, uh, you know, itself uh, a horrendous. And we would have thought we would have evolved from there. But clearly we haven't. And I think for, for, for us today uh, and for the young people more than for us is the fact that where do we go from here? How do we understand peace? Is it possible to uh, focus on peace and not be, uh, you know, sort of trapped by this kind of idea that the, the, the boundary that you talk about, the border is so significant that you can massacre for it. So I don't want to go on onto my own uh, trajectory, but thank you so much, Nirupma Ji, if I may say that. And yes. I request the audience now to please, uh, Share your thoughts if you would have some questions for Dr. Rao. Uh, she's uh, happy to uh, take them on. Would Who would like to ask the first question or seek a clarification or, or anything, make a comment? May I request Geshila to say something if he would like to? Um, uh, nothing really. In fact, I'll... The, I'm just wondering if there are questions from the participants. There must be very interesting questions. Okay, may I, do I have the permission? Yes. Chair? I'm Vijay Karanti. I'm a journalist and uh, taking interest in Tibet since 1972 when I was a young man. And uh, I congratulate uh, Dr. Nirupama Rao for uh, doing all this 
taking all the pain for so many years of understanding. First, you worked in the mill and then you put a few years on understanding the whole process and then many more years to write it. I do appreciate uh, the role of a, a diplomat uh, putting the whole story in words before each word. You know, a diplomat is known for using right words and because you, you always uh, are more serious than people like me, journalists, uh, about the words. Um, of course, I, I am sure uh, there is a need uh, for generations to understand what happened, how it happened, uh, what was the role of individuals, because uh, and if that is done genuinely, it helps a lot of people later to make opinion, to take decisions, and uh, people like me to be critical uh, of those people who were who took decisions and uh, people like me have the advantage of you know, without bothering to see that you know so many decades have passed in between and uh, nehru had to function uh, you know second to second he had to live and take decisions he had no choice of uh, like me I have the choice of, you know, looking back peacefully, finding mistakes, and then shouting. I understand that, and uh, I thank you very much for uh, all the pain because you have provided the basic material for coming generations to make their opinion to, and even for policymakers to make whatever amendments they can do after understanding what went wrong and how how what is the impact and how we can uh, correct it yeah of course that time will tell i was a bit uh, i won't say surprised or shocked when you used at the end the need of uh, conditions uh, which can uh, you know allow us to think in peace you know here um it's not only question to you, I think it's to everybody. Uh, we have two sides, you know, peace cannot come from one side. We have a perpetrator who occupies a nation, who bulldozes a country, who destroys its culture, who is going on even today, you know, committing a cultural genocide. I'm using a very strong word, but unfortunately, uh, I don't think there is a softer word uh, to, to to say, to describe what China is doing in Tibet today or in Xinjiang or in South Mongolia today. Do you think uh, there can be peace or a way of finding peace when one party is bent upon uh, not obeying any rule of law, not being considerate to anybody, not being even repentant for his his crimes uh, over uh, o, 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 about his victims, and unfortunately, in this case, I find victim is not only Tibet. I think a larger victim is today India. That's how I, as a journalist, look at it. So that is why I feel very strongly that Tibet has ceased to be an issue of Tibetans. I, I am one of those who believe Tibet is not only issue of Tibetans. Even if they decide to leave it behind, India cannot afford to. So in this condition, do you think we can have an environment of peace, uh, full, either peaceful negotiation with China about India's interest, leave aside China, Tibetans' interest? So uh, I, I, I fail to understand how we can have uh, that kind of uh, peaceful environment which will compel or uh, initiate uh, China to come up with the, for a peaceful solution. I'm sorry, 
my i i gave a longer background to my question no i understand vivek kanthi ji your concerns and you have spoken from the heart uh, with a lot of emotion and concern for the uh, tibetan people particularly and uh, what has happened to them uh, over the decades so i mean that uh, is something we cannot ignore definitely i look at the whole uh, issue that you just spoke of uh, from the point of view of somebody who has worked in the establishment uh, who is uh, who is a diplomat by training Uh, who has been in the thick of negotiations with china uh, let me say today the asymmetry of power between india and china is quite vast it is much 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 more than uh, in fact in the 50s when we started out our story when our story begins uh, the comparative strengths of india and china were evenly matched in fact in so on some indices india was ahead of china but today that's a different uh, situation and you must take into account the asymmetry of power and and how the negotiations also become asymmetric uh, as a result so it's not as easy as it would seem uh, from you know viewed from certain perspectives uh, in diplomacy and in international affairs the whole question of balancing the whole question of creating an equilibrium in order to ensure that each country is able to get on with their business of development mission building all the concerns that uh, define their own identity as countries that becomes front and center today i think the problem that we face with china after 45 years when not a shot was fired on that boundary is the tension along the line of actual control in and uh, i think the diplomatic and military efforts today are focused on how to diffuse that tension it is not easy the situation is quite abnormal normalcy cannot return until the abnormal situation along the line of actual control is addressed as our foreign minister said the other day so uh, the second point i'd like to make is the complex nature of this relationship you know the pre the presence of the tibetan refugee community in in the of course the hallowed presence of his holiness here in our midst all this i think yes do give some leverage to india vis-a-vis -vis china we are in a strong position definitely when it comes uh, to uh, to where china is on this whole question of tibet because india is seen around the world as a country that opened its arms to the tibetans gave them shelter gave them succor uh, assisted them in keeping alive their identity and of course uh, you know the, his holiness his the presence of his holiness in india is is of course uh, something that the chinese obviously uh, are constantly focused on but as i said this gives india a great deal of leverage and, and i think the challenge is how india is to use the leverage that this presents Uh, to us as a country i think uh, over the years we have tended to be very cautious very careful about the way we uh, describe and define our policy uh, on tibet as far as the chinese are concerned many people suggest to us and i think it's not a bad idea that india should encourage actively encourage negotiations between uh, the tibetan uh, community in exile and the chinese establishment as uh, there were uh, till a few years ago until everything dried up and stopped but that is the only way out for these problems uh, to be resolved uh, i think what mr prime minister nehru said after the 1962 war during a discussion in parliament is rings true even today we cannot march to peking to beijing If that is not a solution the solution is not to show the hand of force i i referred again to the asymmetry of power let us recognize where our strengths lie and where our weaknesses lie our strengths lie in the fact of our democracy our ability to encompass great diversity and to manage that diversity our tradition of offering refuge to people in distress like we did to the tibetans and how uh, even a big country like china 
the second most powerful country in the world today, is I think quite uh, has hands tied when it comes to this whole Tibetan factor in uh, the relations between our two countries. So understanding the strength, where the strengths lie, where the weaknesses lie, I think is very important. Thank you, thank you. Uh, would anybody like to ask the next question? Professor Thapan, may I, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes, Excuse please. Me. Can I ask a question? I think that there's a gentleman who had already started speaking. May we ask him to continue? You could come in next. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, Ambassador Rao, for your excellent uh, uh, talk. Last four months, I have read four books on Tibet and China. Your book, Vijay Gokhale's book, Kanti Bajpayee's book, and Basin, who's, who's I have seen his video. Uh, Karan Thapar was discussing it. That's right. Yeah. So the question is, it's very good that four very solid books have come out today. And uh, so Vijay Gokhale also was like you, and he's given how the Chinese negotiate. So there's a very popular, you know, strategic culture discourse going on in India for the long, long time. So if uh, if that be so, I mean, this is a futuristic question. Uh, how can India sort of strategically, from peace science point of view, get its national interests, including the Tibetans, uh, the, 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 the protection of the ecology of their culture, from the peace science point of view? Because unfortunately, have, Ukraine has shown the humans have, are the most arrogant and the most stupid species on this planet. Dalai Lama also says that. And therefore, it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a shock which has come to me after COVID. I thought that the world would, you know, but the, the worst is going on. And then I, when I read Gokhale's book and Kanti Bajpayee's book, they have also great scholarship. And then your book and Basin's book. So I'm, you know, it's a huge uh, menu out there. And uh, so what I was feeling that Tibet was an independent country from say 1911 till 4950. That's what I was feeling. And now what Ukraine is having, the same problem is there. Nobody, you know, felt bad when Tibet was sort of captured and destroyed even today. So from peace science, my question is uh, conflict resolution. I'm, a, I'm a, in Center for Military History and Conflict Studies. I'm a honorary distinguished fellow. What is the peace science? which can then get us, because we all know, we all glorify war, war, but that will not solve the problem. So that is my just, just an opinion, or it's not a question, but just a comment. You can respond if you want to, otherwise that's fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your excellent book. Uh, and you. Tibet House also. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your very uh, prescient and pertinent observations. Uh, I, my, uh, I think when it comes to seeking a resolution of these very, very complex problems that we face uh, with the Chinese are concerned, I think front and center, of course, is how we are going to resolve the question of the conflicted border. Let us leave, leave aside conflict, but this whole conflicted border uh, between the two countries. What is clear, I think, from uh, the study of the subject, uh, all the research that I did on this uh, issue, is that the British let down India terribly, let down Tibet also, and let down India also. Now, you look at the whole uh, British attitude towards Tibet, of course, they said Tibet was so uh, suzerain, um, in China, suzerainty over Tibet was something that they were willing to accept there was no mention of sovereignty of course but when uh, you know when the crux of the matter came before us in 1950-51 when the Chinese entered Tibet there was nobody to really support Tibet or to rescue Tibet or to provide the kind of uh, solutions that would have worked in Tibet's favor India said they would like resolutions between India and between China and Tibet negotiations to take place to resolve the issue. That really didn't happen. Uh, in fact, uh, a strong China 
overcame a weak Tibet. That was that is the story of our lives uh, during that period. Then again, in 2008, uh, the British uh, sold uh, Tibet down the river, literally, when uh, it the, uh, was announced by the British government, by Mr. David Miliband, that Britain had, uh, had decided to recognize Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. All questions of suzerainty were set aside, and obviously because there were interests in the Britain-China relationship that needed to be furthered, uh, Tibet again became the casualty of that diplomacy. Uh, then, uh, before independence, before India's independence, uh, Britain had a good 30, 35 years after the 1914 Simla Agreement uh, to consolidate its presence in the Assam Himalaya, south of the McMahon Line, that was never done. The extension of administration into Tawang was not done. So in many ways, India was was given a quite a quite a difficult uh, set of cards with which to uh, deal with China on these issues. And uh, in, as far as Ladakh was concerned, uh, borders were never clearly defined uh, between China and Britain uh, before independence. And again, uh, you know, the casualty and the victims, I think, of that policy. Uh, were we as an independent nation, we inherited again a very difficult hand as far as that is concerned. So now the task before us is so, so complex because we have to deal with that history. We have to deal with the strengths and the weaknesses of positions on both sides and come to a solution that is in the interests of both countries. We, I cannot imagine China just giving up all whatever its interests are in this region in favor of India, as much as we would like that to happen. I think we in India must also recognize that in any negotiation, there has to be some give and take. There will have to be uh, concessions to be made on both sides. The most important thing is to understand that the interests of settled populations, as we have in the Arunachal Pradesh sections of the border in towns like Tawang, has to be preserved. Ultimately, I think, you know, in a utopian peace science uh, version of reality, I think we should we should work towards a less closed definitions of where of what borderlines are. We should be prepared to have uh, the restitution in many ways of what existed at a point of time where people came and went where there was traffic between the Himalayan peoples and the Tibetans. And uh, ultimately, my dream is that India will be able to restore its consular presence in Lhasa, where it can help, uh, be of help uh, to, to the Tibetans. Not in any way, we cannot interfere with the political realities. Please understand, I know I'm speaking in uh, the forum of Tibet House, but I think even um, Tibetan friends would understand there are certain realities that you cannot change. You cannot change, uh, you know, the what China has has in a way, uh, you know, been able to enforce in Tibet over the last seventy years. There are certain realities that we have to deal with, but I think it it would be in our interest to seek always uh, solutions that provide for more openness. Uh, between the Tibetan side of our border, the, your border, and the Indian side. More trade, more connectivity, more people-to-people -people contact, more religious and spiritual pilgrimage ties. Uh, you know, that really is what the, what the nature of uh, the Himalayan universe used to be. And I think that should be uh, in the interest not only uh, from the point of view of history, but because also so much of the welfare and the well-being of our, our country in terms of water resources, in terms of climate, in terms of, uh, you know, just the future of our border peoples is tied up with that. And I think the voice of our border peoples has to be heard a little more. This, these are contact zones which are very vital to the understanding of uh, the nature of the problem that India and China.
Thank you. Thank you so much. May I request uh, the other lady who wanted to ask a question to please do so? Dr. Subhashini. Yeah. Uh, Would you like to put I, your video on? Would you like to do that, Subhashini? No, I'm okay as I am. Uh, I may sound very naive, you know, after hearing uh, scholars of such repute. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Nirupama Rao's book uh, has many dimensions, as she has herself explained. It has not only the, uh, the geographical and, but the diplomatic and the humanitarian side of the old conflict uh, between uh, China and us and how it has developed. And I uh, would sound very, uh, uh, maybe even stupid, but uh, when uh, Dr. Rao says that His Holiness is a point of leverage for us, uh, would sound, would be a little bit of a, an ideological uh, stance because I think that is also a great irritant for China because China with its megalomaniac ideas feels that by having His Holiness here and Jawaharlal Nehru at that point of time having given him asylum uh, creates more anger in China than a kind of feeling of, uh, you know, that we are hosting him and that must be irritating them a lot. There's no question that the Chinese are, can, cannot obviously be happy with, with the reality of, uh, of how uh, the Tibetans have made India their home, how his holiness has been here for over six, six decades, there's no doubt. When I used the word leverage, I meant that you know the very uh, presence of of uh, of, a, of a religious personality, uh, one of the greatest men of the century, His Holiness, in on Indian soil, and the fact that you know India has welcomed the Tibetans, and the Tibetans have embraced India too. I think this is. This is certainly a thorn in China's flesh, as you yourself have rightly pointed out. But the fact is that India as a country, you know, as far as the border situation is concerned, we are dealing with military power. We are dealing with enormous, the enormous rise of Chinese influence and power in our region, as also the rest of the world of, of the Indo-Pacific has witnessed today. But there are certain factors like this, you know, uh, His Holiness being in India, the presence of the Tibetan community in India, that I feel personally that India should be prepared to, I use the word leverage, but in, in a sense uh, to, to use for the benefit of the Tibetan people to ensure that there is a settlement of the differences that exist on both sides, Tibetan side and the the Tibetan exile side and the and the Chinese in order to ensure that you know the the the, the feelings the uh, the sensibilities the interests of the Tibetans are are addressed and I think as as the largest democracy in the world as a country that has stood for fundamental freedoms we should be prepared to do a little to encourage encourage China and the Tibetan community in exile to talk to each other and for the Chinese to take a more magnanimous view on this. And I think that is where the rest of the world should also uh, be on India's side to create that weight, to create that, that uh, you know, that critical mass, as it were, of influence. Okay, I think uh, next question is Tenzin. Um, good evening. Am I audible? Am yes, I audible? Yes. yes. Am I clear? Yes. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank Dr. N uh, Nirupama Roy G for um, taking your time to you know write about uh, Tibet, India, and China. And it seven years of research is not at all a easy um, task. And uh, me as a Tibetan and I um, wholeheartedly um, would like to say thank you so much. And, uh, and normally we are not getting opportunity to you know uh, interact with such a uh, personality, right? So I want to ask a straightforward question, uh, which is: um, We all know that Tibet in 1959 and Tibet now is completely different, and same same as uh, we as a refugee in India during 1950s and now 2022 there's a huge differences between being being a Tibetan diaspora itself right we have a huge differences because back then we don't have a good equipments but right now people are getting good equipments to studies and students like me can able to speak and what i'm trying to say here is that the, um, uh, there was a drastic change happened right and it it is uh, evidable and Sorry for the noise. There is a train going. Sorry. And my question is that my question is that um, we know and world knows that you know China is not doing right, and we have been complaining from so long. And everybody in the world knows that China is not doing well. And still now they are using uh, such term like rejuvenation, right? rejuvenation in the name of rejuvenation they are literally destroying everything inside the tibet which is clearly seen by everybody right but still there is a lack of concern from the side of china like ma'am have mentioned before so what is lacking here like we are doing our best right and china is not even being transparent till now and in the name of rejuvenation, using you know uh, beautiful words and doing all these um, unnecessary steps, we, which we which is very evitable. So what I'm trying to say is that, um, so what is the like the perfect solution or like to approach in a different way with China as a diplomat, uh, ma'am yourself as a diplomat. I want to ask, what is, do you think that now, how do we approach with China, right? We have been doing the conversation thing, they are not at all accepting. So do you think that there is like, I know that the strength of peace, it's, it's. Sorry, I think we lost you there. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like? I covered uh, some of the questions raised in my previous replies. Uh, I would uh, like to draw the questioner's attention to what I said earlier. I think we have to create that uh, degree of influence and pressure on China, uh, not just by ourselves, but in terms of the relationships that we built with other countries. Our relationship with the Western democracies, with the United States and Japan particularly, have grown in importance. And there is, I think, the the whole issue, the Tibetan uh, the welfare of the Tibetan community and, uh, you know, what the future of that community is going to be. I think there, there is some worth and value for us to be a little more open, uh, being prepared to discuss these issues with like-minded democracies and to see what kind of a strategy, not in terms of, it's not that, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, engaged uh, or should be engaged in a campaign uh, to, to change borders or to, uh, you know, to, uh, to overturn current realities because that is, that is going to be a path of uh, no return that will involve military conflict. And we've seen, as one of our earlier questioners mentioned, the whole reality in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, these, these questions can never be solved by military conflict. There is no question of that. Unless we are prepared to just uh, deal with the conflagration, with the destruction, with the death of millions of people, I think that is certainly not, not the intention. So I think um, the only way out is to be able to uh, make China understand through our collective actions that 
a rule-based international order is important to understand that they have to work with other countries and they, they cannot, you know, just create patron-client relationships where they go, you know, friends matter and relationships, relationships have always to be relationships between equals. Uh, so it's a long way. The Chinese have not really been initiated, I think, into this manner of thinking or functioning globally as yet, despite the fact that their power and influence has grown so much. Um, you know, just the an, an agenda of domination cannot cannot obviously work. They have to learn to work with countries. Because the COVID-19, the pandemic has shown that, the experience of that, how important it is for cooperation across borders. So that really is what I have to say. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thondup Gyalpo, next. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Ambassador Raoji, for this opportunity to interact with you personally. I've already got a copy of your book, and the time, uh, amount of time it took you to record for the audio version of your book, so I can make it educated. Guess how long it's going to take me to complete the book. Uh, my question: I have two short and uh, simple questions for you. Uh, first one is: uh, I would like to know your views about the. Uh, concept of so-called China's sovereignty or suzerainty over Tibet. And the second one is how would you personally characterize the historical relations between Tibet and China? Thank you very much. Well, as far as the concept of suzerainty and sovereignty, uh, China's suzerainty or sovereignty over Tibet is concerned, I please ask you to read my book, which some of the chapters, early chapters of the book have gone into great detail on the subject. Uh, so, throughout the 19th century, I think the rest of the world used to talk of uh, suzerainty when it came to China and Tibet. But the Chinese from even at that point, even in Republican China, even in Qing China, they were very, very unwilling to accept that definition, that terminology. I think China had always looked at Tibet as a part of its territory, even though the rest of the world may have had uh, different interpretations of what that meant. But by 1950, I think after the Second World War, a lot of former suzerain states had, had it, it is true, thrown off their vassalage and become uh, independent of the suzerain. But that didn't happen uh, where China and Tibet was concerned. I mean, that was the way history played itself out. And today, we cannot change that reality. Today, China's uh, hold over t uh, Tibet indicates that China has decided that it is the sovereign power in Tibet and the rest of the world has more or less endorsed it, recognized it. They name one country that questions it, I don't think there is. And even Taiwan, which is, uh, you know, which has the whole problem of Taiwan is still to be decided between, still to be resolved between China and and. Uh, the remnants of the Chinese nationalists, uh, dis even Taiwan has a similar approach uh, to Tibet. So, so, you know, on this, I think the Chinese everywhere close, close ranks. That's to answer, but please read my book, uh, Suzerainty, as Hugh Richardson said many years ago, is a chameleon word. There are many definitions to it. It's really a chameleon word. But uh, to understand, you know, how Chinese suzerainty over Tibet operated up until, you know, the entry of China's troops into Tibet in 1980. Please do read my book. It's a very fascinating, um, uh, fascinating exposition that comes to light when you when you do the research on this matter. Thank Thanks you to read that. And as far as um, uh, I think the second part of the question, did I did I cover both? I mean, actually, I'm not sure. I think so. Okay. Uh, I think if um, Mr. Thandap Gyalpo is okay, can I ask? Uh, yeah. uh, my second question was, uh, how do you personally characterize the historical relations between uh, Tibet first, and China? My personal view is that, you know, uh, this China's control over Tibet was it was exercised in fits and starts really and there was no uh, you know uh, sort of uninterrupted continuous 
sort of uh, history of China's involvement with Tibet. So it was very much uh, in evidence during certain parts of history and in other eras, it was not Chinese influence and control over Tibet. It was very, very tenuous. And you saw that also between 1911 and 1950, when internal troubles within China made it impossible for the Chinese to exercise any such control. But the minute the, China, the communists came to acquire power, uh, they decided that China, the, they decided that the peripheral, peripheral regions bordering the Chinese mainland, like Xinjiang and Tibet, uh, should be taken over. Thank you. I think Indrani is next. Indrani, Lashka, would you like to ask your question? Unmute yourself first. Good evening, ma'am. It's uh, you had always been an inspiration to me, especially because I'm also a civil servant, and I consider it to be a great privilege to hear from you today. And I look forward to read your book. I'm sorry I haven't read it, but after hearing about the book, I definitely like to read it, this book. And uh, being from Northeast, I have always been, we, we always have got this emotional and historical ties with Tibet. I have a very simple question, a question that has always been ringing in my mind. In fact, it, one can say it's a oversimplified questions to many after hearing all the expert uh, questions. Uh, Ma'am, do you think the tragedy of Tibet is a collective failure of the UN or, or for, for that matter, could the tragedy of U, uh, Tibet could have been averted if UN had intervened if there would have been some collective action on part of the nations. This is something it's something which always rings in my mind whenever I read about uh, the tragedy of Tibet. Uh, so this is my just a simple, very, very simple question, which I just want to clear my doubt, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Indrani. Pleasure to meet you online. I wish you, I wish you the best. Uh, well, I think, uh, yes, Tibet's case, uh, the Tibetan uh, establishment in Lhasa tried their best to bring it before the United Nations, but Tibet received very little support. That was what, That is one of the tragedies of history that, you know, international support for the cause of, uh, you know, Tibet's identity. Not, I, I, really I, I really don't know what the outcome would have been, would, would have been, would it have meant that uh, you know, the, the uh, Tibet's existence as a separate entity would have been vindicated, would have been endorsed, would have been recognized. I really can't say because I think uh, no country seemed to have a clear perspective, a clear view on this matter. Everybody was waiting for the other to take action. The British and the Americans were waiting for India to take the first step. And I think the Americans were quite ready to grant His Holiness uh, uh, to help uh, His Holiness leave Tibet, and uh, they were talking of refuge in Ceylon, as Sri Lanka was called at that time, and all kinds of solutions were, were bandied around. But you see, at that time, the world uh, in the in the in the geography and the geopolitics of the Cold War, uh, everybody was focused on the Korean conflict, the Korean War. China was a belligerent there with the North Koreans and the United Nations forces led by the Americans were fighting the Chinese and the North Koreans. And I think Tibet, again, attention was deflected from what was happening in Tibet. So there's a term I use in the book, which is really a term used by some of the British civil servants who dealt with, with Tibet, saying Tibet became the Cinderella of the story, literally. Tibet became the Cinderella, the Cinderella of history. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you. It was really a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. May, may I ask one more question, please? Yeah, I just like to say that that was a very evocative phrase you used, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Yes, ma who's would you like to identify yourself? Vijay Kranti. Oh, okay, okay, yes, yes, please. Thank you, madam. Uh, sorry, I have already asked one question, but I very strongly feel that uh, of uh, earlier China was 
adamant on uh, one china policy only in the context of taiwan but later on it on its own graduated itself and started referring to tibet xinjiang and uh, south mongolia also in this context and doesn't want any country any government to interfere in those issues claiming that they are part of they are uh, number one uh, uh, it will interfere with one china policy and then they claim these are internal matters of china i think number one the international law does not permit any country to allow to number one endorse the occupation of one country by a second country which the whole world is doing in terms of tibet and Shinji, uh, east turkestan and uh, south mongolia and secondly how and here my question is why indian government is obliged to accept china's uh, the one china policy uh, on many grounds uh, leave aside that they don't uh, respect our sovereignty on uh, arunachal pradesh or uh, kashmir that is a different thing but why india should accept china's claims over tibet in context of one china policy and secondly when word recognizes or endorses occupation of tibet by china or occupation of east turkestan and south mongolia by china to me it appears we are not only going against the governments are not going only against the international accepted law but we are becoming an accomplice in this crime of china so i always fail to understand what are those uh, uh, compulsions of the government of india to cow down whenever china talks of one china policy in co context of tibet or co uh, claims it's an internal matter that has you know people like me could not understand I think the one China policy, when we speak of, really applies to Taiwan. I don't think China refers to Tibet as part of the one China policy because China takes it for granted that Tibet is a part of China, that China is in full control, exercises, uh, you know, uh, sovereignty, whichever way you may look at it, over, over Tibet. These are realities. And I think every country in the world has come to terms with that reality. For us to overturn that, I think, as I said, then we should be prepared for a relationship of interminable conflict with China. And we must be prepared to understand what the repercussions of such a policy will be, how it will weigh upon us in terms of our future, our, the, the fate of our border regions. So let us, I think these are issues that should be deliberated upon with due, with due deliberation, due seriousness, uh, with, with forethought about the directions we are taking. Uh, and uh, I think that really, in terms of the re geopolitical realities, is not a road we can go down. We don't use such terms as East Turkestan. That is, that is something that the, the people who are engaged in uh, you know, seeking to uh, fight Chinese uh, domination of Xinjiang. We are the people. We are. We are not. We are not engaged as a country in the business of supporting freedom struggles of breakaway paths, as Xinjiang would seek to be if the East Turkestan movement had its way. I don't think the Tibetans approach it from that point of view. However, much their aspirations may be to seek more freedom for themselves. But the Xinjiang situation is quite different, I think, from the Tibet situation. In any case, uh, you know, uh, yeah. we have to think very carefully when we talk of sections of certain countries breaking away from countries. I think we have to be very careful about that. Yeah, I think this is the same what is happening with Ukraine today. The whole world is shying away only because everybody is afraid of uh, Russia using uh, nuclear power. And we are doing it same for Tibet and other countries. And yeah, <laughs> I think that's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question from Tibet House? I think somebody in Tibet House wants to ask a question. Yes. Am I right? It's there in the chat.
Okay. Mary, I can't see. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't see your hand. Yes. Yes, Mary. Can we have this? I think is the time at 8.30. Can we ask this to be the last question? Are you okay with that, uh, Dr. Rao? Hmm? Uh, yes, let's, uh, this could be the last question. Yes. Mary, would you like to go ahead? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, Tibet House, will you unmute Mary? Would you like to put it in chat and I can read it out? Can't hear. I think it's uh, probably not working out, right? Yeah, would you like to just type it in the chat box? I can then read it out. Okay. Okay. She prefers not to. So I think in that case, we can uh, close the meeting. Um, I thank Dr. Rao for this very enriching and enlightening conversation with the audience and from your talk. And also for the way in which you, as I said before, I found it a most compassionate talk because you considered all points of view, you didn't take any position, I, at least I didn't see that, uh, an ideological position. And you thought about, uh, or you told us and shared with us how the country should move forward on this particular issue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Tibet House. Geshela, would you like to have the last word, please? Geshela? Uh, so I think I think we can conclude with today's session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nirupama Raoji, for get, taking us your time and sharing your valuable thoughts and taking lots of questions and having a very evolving discussion about the Tibet, China, and India. And uh, Dr. Minakshi Thapanji, and thank you very much for sharing today's session. And uh, thank you, Venerable Geshe-la, for uh, giving us the opportunity to organize these programs. And uh, to all the participants who are very much keen to this topic and uh, uh, bringing lots of questions to Dr. Nirupama Raoji and evolving lots of um, discussions and giving us a ray of hope to the Tibetans and the younger generations for uh, uh, for giving us the uh, for giving us the uh, ray of hope for our um, okay uh, for giving us the ray of hope and uh, thank you all the participants and to all these Tibetan our staff who have been a great support for organizing these conference and uh, organize these programs. So uh, for the next announcement and for the next um, programs, uh, if you would like to join for Tibet House programs and the certificate courses, please um, do visit our Tibet House website and kindly email us at Tibet House office, office at Tibet House dot in. And good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nirukma ji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Geshe Laji. Thank you, Geshe Laji. Thank you, everybody. It was a wonderful evening. Thank wonderful. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nirupama ji. Thank you, Dr. Professor Menakshi ji. And thank you, Vijay Karandi ji. And thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you, Tisumala. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Fritz. Nice seeing you after a long time. Hi, Fritz. <laughs>